John is a retired lieutenant colonel from the Army. He is the recipient of not one bronze star, but two bronze stars. By my quick calculations last night, that probably puts him in the top 500 bravest men in this country. Yay. He's married, two sons. One son is an army captain right now. Wow. And the other son just graduated from Beacon College right here in Leesburg and now works for Disney. His wife is a, uh, uh, a pediatric nurse practitioner. And John is a man of science as well. He is a geophysicist that has traveled the world, literally traveled the world, in search of gas and oil to keep this country energy independent. So he's got a lot, lot going for him. It's my pleasure to introduce John McCoy. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, as uh, Mike said, my name is John McCoy, and I'm running for U.S. Congress, District 11. I'm challenging Representative Dan Webster in the Republican primary, August 20th. I believe more good people need to run for office, and I'm fortunate to be at the stage in my life where I'm able to do so. And I'd like to introduce my background, qualifications, a bit about why I'm running for office. And I'm new to politics. My professional career has been in the oil industry over 20 years. <coughs> my career field is earth science, with my technical specialty being geophysics. I follow projects around the world, starting in West Texas and New Mexico, had assignments in Houston, Cairo, Egypt, Oslo, Norway, Nigeria, Angola, and Kazakhstan. I was able to provide for my family, and they loved the international adventures and living overseas. The future was bright, that is, until the November 2020 election. Biden was elected, and I was laid off the next month. Joe Biden had declared war on the oil industry, and we see the effects today in the high gasoline prices at the pump. The Biden administration's entire energy policy has just been wrong, resulting in higher energy costs, higher gasoline prices, and higher electricity prices. This results in increased manufacturing and transportation costs. Retail products are now more expensive. All this has resulted in the inflation we see today. We need a smarter national energy policy. We need affordable and reliable energy so our economy can thrive. This is one of the reasons why I'm running for office. In addition to my career in the oil industry, I served over 20 years in the U.S. Army Reserve. I joined as a private E-1 at the age of 17, completing basic training during the summer between my junior and senior years of high school. I utilized the GI Bill to pay for college, and upon graduating, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the engineer branch of the U.S. Army. After 9-11, I trained as a civil affairs officer and in 2004 deployed for a year to Iraq. I did not another year-long deployment in 2008, but to Afghanistan. I am proud of my service, completing our assigned missions and keeping my soldiers safe. I earned two Bronze Star Service Medals and a Combat Action Badge for my combat deployments. I retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. What I studied and what I learned from my combat deployments is that the United States must stand up to evil forces around the world. It is better to have the battlefield be the mountains of Afghanistan than the buildings of New York City. We must pick our battleground and not retreat. But our foreign policy needs to be smart. The U.S. is the arsenal of democracy, but we do not need to fight every fight. The United States has allies and partners around the world. But there are ungoverned areas where terrorism thrives, feeling safe, and plotting future attacks. The United States needs to have the courage to fight. The Bush, Obama, and Trump strategy in Afghanistan may have seemed hopeless to some, but progress is being made slowly. With an undeveloped and an uneducated population, progress in Afghanistan would take decades. Instead of the analogy of Europe after World War II, the better comparison is the 19th century American Indian Wars in the West. Yes. The presence of our troops there gave the Afghan government and its military the courage to fight for their future. But we saw the Biden administration surrender Afghanistan, surrender to evil, for the Taliban <coughs> are cruel. I had lived in Islamic countries before, but I never saw the level of mistreatment to women as that the Taliban show. Half the population of Afghanistan now has no future. 
The Biden administration has destroyed the hopes of 16 million Afghan women. The need for a smarter foreign policy is another reason why I am running for Congress. I spent my childhood summers on my great-grandfather's ranch in North Polk County, north of Polk City and six miles south of Lake County Line. He raised cattle, hogs, and crops and had orange groves. I learned to fish, shoot, and drive on his ranch. My extended family lives all across the United States, but Central Florida is the only place multiple generations of my family have lived. It is special to me. My great-great-grandfather arrived here in 1870. He and other relatives are buried in Arbordale City Cemetery. His son, my great-grandfather, who had the ranch, was General James Van Fleet. The General James A. Van Fleet State Trail is named in his honor. It extends from Polk County into Lake and Sumter counties. His achievements in World War II and the Korean War inspired me. He was my hero. And he was my inspiration to enlist in the Army Reserve at a young age. Military service is a family tradition. Both grandfathers, my father, my brother, uncles, one aunt and cousins have all served in the military. I am proud to have carried on my family's military service tradition. My oldest son is a West Point graduate and currently an Army Captain in the 82nd Airborne Division. He has carried on the family's tradition to the next generation. But it is my youngest son who inspires me to be the better person. He's autistic, has a learning disability. Everything in his life is harder, more of a struggle. The autism spectrum is broad. Some only are affected by being socially awkward, and others are so severe as needing to be institutionalized. Each autistic person is different. When my son was diagnosed at age three, I felt like my whole world had collapsed. But we faced each challenge, each hurdle. And as I mentioned, everything is harder, but the joy is all also much more greater with each accomplishment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a firm believer in school choice. My son's success is a result of my wife and I tailoring his education to meet his needs. <coughs> he started at public school at age three in a special education program. He then attended the American International School in Nigeria with the resource aid provided. He did online schooling and actually graduated from a boarding school that had specialized in teaching autistic students. Leesburg in Lake County is blessed to have a college that specializes in teaching students with learning disabilities. Beacon College is such an excellent place. My son just graduated there in December. He is now doing a paid internship with Disney. His confidence has grown and I'm a very proud dad. That's awesome. School choice was instrumental in his success, tailoring his education to achievements, uh, to his abilities and career goals, and recognizing and helping him with his disability. He has a chance to achieve to his fullest potential, but others are not so fortunate. Those stuck in an inflexible education system. Without competition, there is less incentive for a school to improve. Just mediocre becomes the norm in a public school. Advocacy for school choice, promoting competition, and helping those with disabilities reach their fullest potential is another reason why I'm running for Congress. In addition to my two sons I've talked about, I'd like to also mention my wife, my, my life partner. We've been married over 29 years. She has shared in my adventures overseas and on the street, creating a home wherever we move, the Middle East, Africa, Europe. And when I was deployed, she handled it all while I was gone. She's wonderful. She is a pediatric nurse practitioner and university professor. Her professional career is very different from mine. Over the years, I've heard many of her healthcare stories, what is messed up in the healthcare industry, but also, the medical advances that have occurred. But the consistent theme I observe is compassion. When I go to the VA hospital for care, I also <coughs> observe the compassion shown. Yes, some of the things at the VA are messed up, there's room for improvement, but I see the compassion shown to our elderly veterans. The United States is a great nation and we have the capabilities to help those less fortunate. And I do want to talk about the current issues that is in the news. I believe we need to have a secure border. I believe in the rule of law, but the United States is a Christian nation and a compassionate nation. While serving in the Army in Iraq, I dealt with many, many refugees. It is truly heartbreaking hearing their stories and seeing the situation they are in. 
The nation's illegal immigration situation is a total disaster. There is no simple solution. It may seem easy to sit in our living rooms and say deport them all, but it's hard to actually tell an individual immigrant that the United States does not want them in. I am for legal immigration, obeying the rules, applying and entering the country legally. The United States benefits from immigration. I personally see the benefits. 5% of the U.S. military are immigrants, foreign born. An additional 7% are second generation Americans, born to an immigrant. Yes, we hear stories about the immigrant criminal, but we also see the entrepreneurial spirit of other immigrants. One example is my interpreter who served beside me in Iraq. He was an Iraqi Kurd, a minority group in the country. There was a civil war in Iraq in the 1970s and the Kurds lost. My interpreter had to flee or be killed. He, immigrate, he immigrated to the United States, thus becoming a Kurdish American. He became a realtor and a <coughs> social businessman and raised a family. When the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003, he and his family all volunteered to serve as interpreters. He was assigned to my civil affairs team. His wife, also a Kurdish American, deployed with another civil affairs team, and his two sons deployed with the U.S. Army Special Forces. They are true American patriots. Mm -hmm. And the United States is better off with them. Oh, yeah. There is no easy fix to our nation's immigration mess, but the first step is to secure the border. The status of the illegal immigrants must be addressed, because to do nothing is the worst outcome. There were 11 million illegal immigrants in the United States in 2020. During the Biden administration so far, an additional 6 million have entered. 17 million stateless individuals roam in the streets of our nation. Their status is undefined, <coughs> lacking documents to start a life, to work, to earn. They become desperate and they turn to criminal activities just to survive, which is the problem. The situation cannot be ignored. It must be addressed. This is another reason why I'm running for Congress. And I hope today, my, from my talk today, you know more about me. I grew up admiring President Ronald Reagan and the leadership he displayed to the free world. I am pro-life, pro-Israel, pro-Ukraine, pro-democracy and free markets. Traditional Republican values. China, Russia, and Iran are not our friends. We must be smarter in our policies. The Republican primary is August 20th. I'm challenging the incumbent, Representative Dan Webster. He has served the politics for over 44 years, since 1979. He has served honorably. I do not have anything against him. He votes along the Republican Party line, for the most part. But I believe he has lost the energy to fight for us. <coughs> He is one of the most absent members of Congress. This is an issue that came up in the last election uh, when Laura Limmer was challenging it. So the question to the voters is, when do you retire a congressman who has served this district well but is now getting old? I'm running for Congress to replace him and carry on his good works on behalf of all y'all. But I need your support. Thank you for the opportunity to talk, and I'll be happy to see you. Okay, two things before we begin. First of all, the format is you write your questions down on a card. They are circulated around the room. Pass the cards to me, and I will ask the question. Number two, please silence your cell phones. Vance is going to get real upset real quick. Number three, I neglected to introduce uh, some candidates for office that are in the audience uh, this morning. We have Keith Parner. He's running for District 26, State Representative. We have Ralph Smith. Ralph is a twofer. He's running for State Committeeman here in Lake County, and he's running for the North Lake County Hospital Board. And with that, I will begin asking questions. If you have any questions, pass them up. If not, I'm going to start with one of my own. Hey, Mike. We've got a mother of a uh, county commissioner, Kirby Smith. Yes, we do. That's right. Brenda. And I would like to say, just real quick. Oh, he's coming. Uh, <laughs> Kirby has on, on Facebook, a, he does board shorts. I don't know if anybody knows that or not. But he has a board short on Beacon College that is absolutely amazing. It explains Beacon College and what all they've done and how they built a new campus. And it's, uh, it would be interesting for you to see and all the rest of your own look at it. But tune in to his board shorts every Monday, every Wednesday. 
He does Or maybe Monday. Friday. Or no, every <laughs> Wednesday. He does them on Monday. He's not wearing shorts. He needs a video short. <laughs> Or He's a surfer. Okay. <laughs> We're going to start the question and answer period. John, this is the copy of the current Republican National Platform until next week. Okay, as you can see, it's about 60 pages. It is thick with goals, but it is also so thick with policies to achieve those goals. I don't know if you've reviewed the new national platform that will be adopted next week, but while it is very thick with goals, it's very light on policies to achieve those goals. And the other thing, I know that you're a pro-life uh, politician, the other thing is, is that it seems to get the national party away from the pro-life question and delegate that issue to the states. I'm just wondering how you feel about those issues. Well, so that's a big question. Um, did you so, write that down? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> right here. <laughs> so you know, uh, I guess, uh, guess uh, for the second one, I, I am a pro-life. Um, and uh, you know, when I was younger, I probably just didn't care. But um, you know, in college, after college, when my child was was born, he was the first baby I ever held, and from then on, I've always been pro-life. And um, but I do believe, uh, as obviously recent um, advances, you know, the um, on, on the federal level as as far as restricting abortion, in parallel to all the legal stuff, at the local and state level, there needs to be more um, initiatives for helping women that are in distress to decide to carry their baby too. So, it, separate from all our legislative advances the Republican Party are working on, uh, separate to that, on the local and state level, not really the federal, is you know, if a young woman who's unmarried, no job, is, is pregnant, what resources? Because otherwise, the unintended consequences of the legislation is you will have a back alley abortion uh, resulting in problems. You will have falsely accused people of rape so they can get the rape exception. Or you will have a lot of brothers having to take the fall for their sister going out and getting pregnant. So you got to think about the, all these unintended consequences. In, in, in parallel to any legal avenues, the pro-life movement needs to focus on providing practical support for women in distress to be able to carry their baby, even go in, a, you know, what adoption services or foster parents and all that. So you have to have that whole other part in addition to the, uh, the legal efforts going on. And the other part with the Republican platform, um, it is that's a huge question, and I'm constantly, you know, researching that. And a lot of it is um, for uh, President Trump has a lot of good policies, economic, and foreign policies. So I, I really am a supporter of a lot of his policies as far as energy which is uh, you know, my specialty, the policies that Trump uh, have endorsed in, in his administration and for the future are spot on. And last month, I was up in uh, Washington, D.C., in Congress with a uh, association focusing, or actually three different associations of geophysicists, petroleum geologists, and uh, petroleum engineers focusing on natural gas prices. That's currently you know, trying to supply the United States with cheap, reliable natural gas, and Trump's policies, what he had in the, for his administration in the future, are spot on, fixing that problem. So, so yes, yeah, so the areas where I've, I, I know, um, I can talk about a lot, and then I'm still learning on the others, on the Republican platform. Okay. Questions, questions, questions? Pass it over. Uh, yep. Pass it over. Pass it over. Pass the answer is always good for a few. These aren't mine yet. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He'll have about chance, which is good. He comes up with good stuff. Okay. This one is a good one, and this one hammers it right home. Daniel Webster is familiar and has Trump's endorsement. What do you need to do to beat him? Okay. So some of the things uh, in talking about you know, Congressman Webster, 
he has a 44-year career. He's done great things at the state level. He moved up to uh, Congress level, but a lot of it is his energy. If you've talked to him recently, if you've seen him move and and <laughs> <See him> move. <laughs> uh, and speak at events, a lot of it, you know. You, and one of the things I'll pass this around, and this um, is the miss votes. And so Daniel Webster is number 19 in the number of U.S. congressmen that is not showing up. Um, and so I'll pass this around. Sure. This is this is showing. Okay. And this is from the 117th Congress, which is the last full two years for the statistics. And on my website, I put the link. But you could Google, you know, go up to the State Department. Uh, the, yes? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to yeah. interrupt your train of thought. You did. You gentlemen, I sure did. You gentlemen refer to this gentleman as a politician. I would like to know the difference between what you would describe a statesman as opposed to a politician. Okay. Well, um, well put that in writing, please. No, because I can't spell. <laughs> I usually write. go around with a dictionary. Don't ask. God bless. So uh, I guess, you know, you could say... You got uh, a heckler here. There is, a, I guess, a career politician who's always been a politician for their entire career. Uh, there is a citizen statesman you could think of that steps up and tries to go into politics. So... I hope you have a Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I did not decide... Uh, to be a politician right out of college, or when I was in the army, or when I was in the oil industry, and so it's pretty much. And you're not a lawyer. Thank and you. I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> and um, it is pretty much is because I'm now an empty nester. My, as I said, my last son, that I have more time on my hands, so I can now give back. Uh, and I'm too. And I'm, uh, you know, as I support the army, I'm now. Uh, too old and feeble to actually be running around. With you. So, but sadly, I've aged out of that part of contributing, which is not my That's family tradition. So, That's a good thing. So, okay. and I guess on that same note, when we talk about his absenteeism um, for Congressman Webster, I'll also like to point out the number of bills introduced, which is um, a lot of times, unless you're like a social warrior like uh, Congressman Gates or AOC on the Democrats, you know, very leading the way on social causes, uh, a lot of times a congressman is rated on, on what legislation he's working on. And Congressman Webster is rated number 416 out of 435 congressmen on the number of bills uh, introduced. This is, uh, I'll pass this around, and uh, it shows he's only worked on four bills in the 117th Congress for that two-year period. And um, please pass this around. Sure. And then I also like to talk about when we th when we think about Trump's endorsement, um, there was the Webster Sabatini thing that has been going on in the news for a while. Mm -hmm. Whichever side you take, you know, whether or not uh, it was an official endorsement or not, there's two sides to that coin. But one of the things that is very evident from watching the news is uh, Congressman Webster went up to uh, New York City outside the courthouse and gave a speech and uh, in support of President Trump. And Donald Trump Jr. was right behind him taking notes. And following that, there was the social media written um, Twitter or uh, true social post supporting um, Congressman Webster. But I'd like to say that for the second impeachment vote against Donald Trump that occurred in um, January of 2021, the second time, Daniel Webster did not vote. Okay, and so he did not show up to vote, and it's uh, documented on um, on the internet, on um, on the congressional voting record. So I will pass this around. January 13th, impeaching Donald Trump, President of the United States, for high crimes and misdemeanors. Daniel Webster did not vote. So, why did he not vote? Was it a health issue? Is he not healthy enough to be congressman? Or did he waver in his support of Donald Trump? And did that, is that why Donald Trump took so long to, to, um, to endorse him? I don't know, but please pass that around. Yeah. Excuse me, is that all it took for Daniel Webster to disappear and then um, uh, 
I, I, I don't know what, but I'm just saying from, from the meeting, you know, okay. there, if you listen to, uh, you know, the Sabatini Webster camp, and I know uh, Ralph Smith, he's, he's piped in a lot on that, but there's, a, there's a, a lot of ongoing social media talk on that. To uh, that, on, on Trump support, uh, following, the, uh, following the election, when we look at, um, Following the last election in uh, December of 2020, or sorry, in the, in the following the 2020 election, uh, when we look at Congressman Webster's voting record and whether or not he supports Trump or not, as far as Trump's issues, what I noticed was, and I'll pass this around, in the 116th Congress that goes through 2020, that right after the election, Daniel Webster did not vote for Trump's position. Right after the election, and it's documented on the congressional record, in the five bills afterwards, he voted against Donald Trump's positions. And I don't know why, and maybe it was legit or not, but it's yeah. very dis noticeable it's concerning. Yes. record of him voting with Trump's position up until the election, and then afterwards, for the remainder of the 116th Congress, he did not vote with his position. Um, and then the last one, the last one is the um, a article that was put out by Webster being ranked one of the least effective legislators in the 117th Congress. And Senator Rubio was noted as being the, one of the most effective senators so it, it went through uh, analyzing a lot of them, yeah. and that was talked about. So okay. next question. Now we're going to cover four different issues, and I'll give them to you one at a time. What are your what specific <coughs> actions will you commit to do on illegal immigration? You touched on it, but get a little bit more specific. So uh, what specific actions will you commit to do on illegal immigration? So number one is secure the border be it a wall, fence, whatever is necessary to 100% secure the border, even if it's troops. That is number one, to prevent no further ones. And then the, the second one is this huge, there should not be a years long backlog of cases. We should adequately adjudicate it, if it's military lawyers, immigration lawyers, or whatever, to screen out a economic opportunist to a political asylum uh, refugee and then also, you need to, if they are coming in as a work visa, you need to sh see if they actually have a criminal record mm -hmm. background check in their home countries. Yes. Yes. And so, um, when I worked overseas, I had to get a background check from a local sheriff before I could get a work <laughs> visa. Over. And I don't think any of that happens. So, um, so and that's that. So that, that is the, the second one. And obviously, if they're if their asylum case is <coughs> per our laws, then it's adjudicated, they can get a work permit to earn a living in our society. And if it's if it's deemed not allowed in, they need to be deported immediately. But you cannot have these people linger in our society unchecked with no money. What are they gonna do? They're gonna commit crimes. Okay, the next issue is this. What specific actions will you commit to do on Chinese aggression and Chinese spies in the U.S. Okay. Chinese uh, aggression is, is um, if you think of Trump, did a very good job for him in his foreign policy, mm -hmm. and he prevented he he portrayed a uh, president of strength and the military of strength. Yes. Okay, and now we have a president who's the exact opposite, and we have the military, which I still. Uh, work with, it's concerned about a lot of woke issues. Yes. And so it's embarrassing that the army's embarrassed and other military services are embarrassing. Um, I work working on a uh, contract with the Defense Department. We had to redo the contract because the bases, the names have changed. So all these, uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, is now Fort Liberty because oh Fort yes. Bragg was a Confederate general. Oh. Um, Fort Pickett, Virginia, had to be changed. Um, 
Fort Hood in Texas, largest military base in the United Now, Fort Cavazos. Oh, cool. What's that mean? Uh, it's just a different name of a different soldier. But Fort Hood, he was a Confederate general. <coughs> so Fort Rucker, uh, Alabama, the big aviation school for the Army. Rucker, he was a Confederate general. And that's now called Fort Novus Hill. So all that, all, every single contract has to be changed. All the signs. and So now that all that's been done, we've wasted a lot of money. The, the military is just embarrassed. And now we're working on road names. So we have Lee Street at West Point. We have to rename that. Uh -huh. So it goes on and on. And, just, and then we have our transgendered soldiers, the Space Command that's now, I don't know. So, the, so everybody sees that. And so our enemies see that. China sees that. And uh, it's weak. We surrendered Afghanistan. So our allies see that. When Trump was in office, um, I, I initially I was kind of baffled and kind of disagreed with, but he made fun of, of NATO and said we should pull out. We should, you know they're ineffective. They're not even contributing the two percent of their GDP. And he honed in and is very undiplomatic. And I thought, hey, that that's, might not be a good approach. However, it was. And I have to admit, my initial thought was wrong. Trump was right. Yes. And since then, all the NATO countries are much stronger. And they're now being able to stand up more to Russia because of Trump's yes. instigation. So it's the, um, um, the, the benefit strength. that we're seeing. It's just providing strength. And the, uh, the, the second one about the spies, spies the infiltration. So when I was laid off from Chevron, I was a geophysics um, and in Houston, all the oil industries, Chevron laid off 25% of their professional staff. The whole, um, the whole uh, company shrank, basically. Everybody was, sh was shrinking, with the exception of the Chinese National Petroleum Company. And they had a research office in Houston. And they hired the laid off Americans. Oh, wow. So, um, and... Uh, Within my company, there was, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of Chinese. When I got hired by Chevron as a geophysics, I was the only white male hired in the department that year. I was looking to reverse. Everybody else were uh, Chinese individuals uh, or Indian. And they send their people to come over to U.S. to get in companies, um, work visas, and different things. And it's interesting hearing the Chinese coworkers, they will tell you their other co-workers are Chinese spies. Oh, it, it's, okay. it's, it's baffled. And so, I, you know, you have to do better background checks. Yes. yes. Um, and, and so, I, you know, they will rat out the, each other, and but apparently we allow that. So, um, so yeah, so it would be cracking down on that. No. <laughs> what are you going to do about rolling back the printing of money? <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you, thank you, whoever wrote that one down. So, in, 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 for COVID, um, if you look at our national debt, it's skyrocketed, and a lot of it is, um, you know, maybe the uh, crisis of um, uh, crisis of the times. They decide, to, you know, to just pump money in, but you have to. You have to have a national government budget that is within our means. Yes. That is the first step. And, and so future generations <laughs> will be looking back at this time of, we look at a, why did the U.S. print money during these years? Just because of the COVID crisis. And, and, and they will, you know, it'll look back. And you, you can look at the national debt over the past, you know, since the nation was founded, and you know, borrowing debt increases at national crises, you know, world wars and stuff like that, and there's kind of no excuse for why as borrowing had to be to such an extreme at this time. That's the first number one stuff. Okay. All right. Now you can probably talk uh, very well on this issue because uh, your family has a background in it. What are you going to do about reducing regulations over farmers? So, that's a good one. Um, so, there's a, 
on the regulation on farmers. Um, Cow farts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, so, <laughs> and it's 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 interesting. A good half of the regulations that are being imposed by farmers are on state levels. Okay, and so different states, and the most notably is out in the West, mm -hmm. out in the California farmers, and they're being um, driven out of business. And then um, we, at the national level, the, the cow farts and, you know, these uh, really um, uh, mandates that are just uh, non nonsense. Yeah, absurd. Yeah. You know, they're not backed in science. <coughs> A cow is part of nature, you know. And, and, um, and, and usually uh, on some of these particular blue states that they're having uh, these mandates and pushing them out, and you're going to end up having um, four nations feed the United States, which then becomes a national security uh -huh. issue. Yeah, that's and, and then, in, in, um, and then, sadly, in Florida, and it's not at a federal level; it's a state level. We're, we're because Florida is such a great state; everyone's moving here. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of agricultural land just now being uh, put into uh, subdivisions, yeah. and so that is a lot of land use at the local level, mm -hmm. and it's happening faster than you can have government infrastructure catch up. So schools, you know, water and sewer, so you now have an uh, elect, you know, you're straining of your utilities because mm -hmm. development's having, happening faster than um, government can, you know. But at the, at the same time, you know, um, so anyway, so that's a very <coughs> uh, complex thing. If it's a, you, can ha you can solve part of that problem on a federal level by these uh, EPA regulations, and then a lot of it is on the, the local level. Okay, the next one is about federal legislative priorities for, and this is where it gets interesting, for local entities like school districts, cities, county boards. So, what's the question? Federal legislative priorities for school districts. They cities. have them. So, you, you know, when you, when you think about it, you, if you read back to the Constitution, you know, read through the Constitution, and, you know, the, the federal government is supposed to handle, focus on issues the state can't. Right. And, and, and so there, there's some things that, you know, and I always think of the, the Department of, Edu of Education was started in President Carter's term, I think it was in the 70s. Yes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you think of um, why, why do you think that the, it takes the federal government to be able to handle a local school district? And so you might, you know, you might need a, a federal agency that can compare different states because then you have competition. If you're Iowa and you see that uh, Nebraska has a better school district, you then you would improve yours by natural competition. But um, you, you shouldn't be it shouldn't be so over and bearing that the federal government knows more than the, the local. And obviously there's, there's uh, legislation about um, discrimination and access of services and all that. Those are laws of the past, but um, the state knows a lot better what it's needed. So. Okay. Uh, and and uh, it, it also mentions cities and Lake County boards. Thing. Now, I'll, I'll clarify this a little bit, all right? One of the departments of our federal government that I find to be really offensive is housing and urban development. What does the federal government have to do with housing and urban development? It seems to me to be a city issue. You know, how do you feel about that? So, about the housing and urban development? Well, yeah, and, and there, the federal government's involvement in cities, in county government. So, now, if you think about uh, home, um, homelessness is a problem, and so it is a local problem in different cities, and so the housing and urban development department, um, it is the federal government's attempt to help the local government. That was, if you think of intention, but then the, the reality is hindering. Yeah. So, um, 
no, no one wants to see homeless people on the street. That's just, uh, you know, and for every homeless person on the street, there's, there's a story about how they ended up on the street. You know, and a good third of them are drug users, a third of them are, have mental issues, and a third of them are economically dis disadvantaged. And so um, it is up to the local um, governments to solve that. And so, however, when some cities, West Coast cities, are just totally overwhelmed, if you go out to the, you know, Los Angeles, there's 10 cities the you know, everybody has a, recognizes a need to solve that issue. Local government, they keep adding money to it, but it doesn't solve it, because money doesn't always solve problems. Federal government and the housing and urban development, they're trying, but it's unsuccessful. Okay, I'm trying to ask these in some sort of order that makes sense. Okay. And, and I guess um, while you're doing that, well, one other thing, you know, housing and urban development, there's the Section 8 housing program, which is, I know, uh, Anthony Sabatini, it's one of his campaign issues. And um, uh, even one of my rental houses up north, I, it's a Section 8, and uh, it, it, the program allows the poor, the, the financially distressed tenant, who would otherwise be homeless, to pay part, a sliding scale, depending upon their income, part of the money uh, for rent, and then the local government and the state government, and it's probably through federal grants, I'm not sure, they pick up the rest. So as long as they pay their little bit, then the rest of it. So it behooves them to pay their small amount, and then they, they get the large amount. And <coughs> it's a very neat idea. You provide housing with this person. However, um, if you have a whole community, whole neighborhood of just Section 8 housing, mm -hmm. then you have the ghetto forms. Yes. And, and right. so, and that's the problem. So, and then you have the decaying city and all that. So you have to be strategic and, um, you know, not, in a community, not everyone is wealthy. And so, but mm -hmm. if you put all the Section 8 in one area. So that's, again, that's a good intention, but it's not properly being uh, executed. And it's creating these, uh, Okay, what will you do to eliminate wokeism, DEI, CRT, etc. in federally funded universities, in federal agencies, with federal grants, and concerning federal vendors? So, um, for federal agencies, we, it takes a president, uh, President Trump, when he gets, he'll sign an executive order to his cabinet and the wokeism, which I experienced in the Army, will stop. Good. Okay? And so, uh, through his secretary uh, of education down of how they can influence universities um, at the federal level, but it'll, and it'll take state governors to issue the actual decrees at the state level for the uh, state universities. And then the, the DEI, and it's interesting because DEI is a little bit run amok. And so, uh, 10, 15 years ago, at Chevron, an oil company, which were not, were not <coughs> liberal baskins of, of um, social movements at an oil company, they actually found, back then, it was called D, uh, diversity and inclusion. The E, no private corporation wants to talk about equity, you know, or do equal, equal pay. But it was just uh, diversity and inclusion. And what they found, uh, their analogy was uh, diversity is you know, kind of inviting people to the party, and inclusion is asking them to dance. That was, that was, that was our CEO's uh, announcement. But they actually found that having a, a private company on their own doing a diversity and inclusion program helped profits. We made more money. And the diversity part was diversity of nationalities. And so when I worked in Nigeria, they had 36 different tribes. And so... Uh, among the Africans, they they fought all the time. <coughs> they had 50% uh, of the country was Muslim, 50% of the country was um, Christian, and they, you know, they had the American. We were like the neutral arbitrators as far as like, employee valuations and stuff like that, promotions. So they actually rolled out that actually helped 
having a diversity inclusion. They saw it in their profits. But the idea is let the private companies do any initiative they want. Yes. But you don't need to make fun of them. Starbucks might get away with having a diversity and inclusion, or an E now, DEI. If that, if it, that, lets, if that, if they make money doing it, that's fine. Bud Light, they saw that having a <laughs> yeah. DEI hurt them. I still don't drink Bud Light. Yeah. <laughs> Target, they're, they're, Target you know, still don't so <laughs> the, the, the private, private sector will, will, will sort it out. Mm -hmm. and, and so having a, uh, a mandate just it doesn't do anything. So, just end it. Okay, here's an interesting question. Would you vote to prosecute the president, the vice president, secretaries of uh, the various departments, the CIA, the FBI, the IRS, or other top cabinet members for treason and insurrection from wow. within the government? For the current administration? Yeah. Well, that it doesn't say the current administration. Okay. Yeah, so the current administration. Hold okay. them accountable. So uh, you should you should definitely investigate them, and if the evidence warrants, then you, you proceed. But if the evidence doesn't warrant, then you, you don't. You know, uh, if you're a cabinet, you know, if, if you're a cabinet official, and you know, I think of a uh, um, and, and, and you're your president, your boss, tells you to do something and you're just following along, at what point is it just incompetence and at what point is it treason? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it, you have to really gather all the evidence. And so, Hold on to your conscience. That is, that's integrity right there. So, in the Army or in the, the military, in the Uniform Code of Military Justice, it specifically talks about unlawful orders. And so, if you're if you're told to shoot an unarmed combatant, and you shoot, then that's punishable, even if you're ordered to. So, uh, it's the same way. If you follow the evidence at the cabinet level, was it treason or, or was it incompetence? Because, um, you know, being stupid is not against the law. You know, if you're an incompetent person, you can't teach stupid. Yeah, but but uh, but if you're purposely uh, being treasonous, then you know evidence will point it out. Okay, this one I'm going to reverse the order in which they're written. Is the IRS a central bank, A, and what method is there to lessen bureaucracy at the federal level? So, this um, pro uh, Project 2025, have you all heard about yeah. that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so it's a thousand page document if you go on to it, and um, you know I've only started reading it, and um, it's actually a lot of smart people contributed to it, and um, some things I agree with, some things I don't, but it's just well thought out, a lot of intellectuals. And specifically, I haven't read just maybe 5% of it, but there was a, a specific chapter on the IRS. And IRS is 81,000 people, but only two presidential appointees that are actually overseeing them. So that is, uh, and one of, another thing is they had a huge increase in billions spent for IT so they can better do their job, yet now they want to hire 87,000 yeah. new IRS, <laughs> which doesn't make sense. They, they got all this, they got billions of, for IT to streamline their processes and, and be more efficient, and AI. now they want to double the workforce. Yeah. Yeah. But that is an agency, and the conclusion of that is that is, is endemic of, with only two presidential appointees, it's very hard for them to really oversee yeah. all yeah. Mm -hmm. of the technocrats and these, the swamp, which is are these, the GS-15, the senior executive service that kind of run the government from administration to administration, and we're, you know, in the, in the Defense Department, you have assistant secretaries, undersecretaries, and, you know, you have a lot more. But the IRS is specifically noted as being underrepresented because it was formed way back when, and only two overseers are needed by the president and now it's like ballooned out of control because it's always hidden. So, so yeah, you need more presidential oversight on that. Okay, now is there a method or what method would you suggest to lessen the size of our bureaucracy? So, um, so a case in point with the IRS, if you had a presidential appointed representatives at the agency level, they can start rooting out um, the inefficiencies. And the Department of Defense, 
um, I guess two years ago, I, kind of, I was kind of part of the problem, but I see there's a lot of, um, as the Army fails to recruit soldiers, young soldiers, they have to have Army civilian employees do work. So the, and, and I'm sure it's the same with the other services, uh, but my, I'm familiar with the, the Army. And because of that, the civil servant workforce in the Department of Defense has skyrocketed. Oh, yeah. And one of the reasons why we can't recruit young soldiers is because, and we're not asking young soldiers, is unlike me, um, I joined the Army Reserve to get the GI Bill to go to college. Mm -hmm. But now, if you're a young person, just get a student loan and have yeah. it be forgiven. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't have to, you, know, you don't have to go into the military to get the GI Bill. So they're getting something for nothing, and so they don't have to yeah. join. So that is why for, let's say, the last five years, the, the Army has failed to achieve their recruiting goals, mm -hmm. and, um, and the other services are also struggling. Yeah. So you just need to start eliminating a lot of the civil servants. Okay, I've got uh, an expansion of that. Will you champion the use of AI? to replace 50% of federal employees and contractors. That, that's inevitable. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if it's 50%, but we're going to, just like, it's you, be you, you know, you, you think of, um, you know, Microsoft Word and the, you know, computer, desktop computer came along and the secretaries were being eliminated because people could do more. Uh, and then Excel spreadsheets came around. And then, um, and, and then with AI, and, even in uh, the intelligence and, and weapons, AI is being incorporated. Okay, now I'm going to throw a wrench into the works here. Personal observation. I was a paramedic lieutenant for the city of New York. And my employees, like federal employees, enjoyed both civil service protection and union protection. It was virtually impossible for me to fire an employee, Ouch. even though I knew they were killing patients on the street. <sighs> paperwork had to be generated. Paperwork, 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 and that paperwork meant a dead end. It seems to me that the only way to reduce the federal workforce is through attrition, and that means decades. What are your thoughts on that? So it, it is the the Fed, yes it does take it's very hard to eliminate a competent federal employee. So after Chevron, after I was laid off in the oil industry, um, I was hired on by the Army Corps of Engineers as a physical scientist, and I was assigned to um, uh, an intelligence program in D.C. under the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition Logistics and Technology. This be the most premier area. And from there, it was amazing to see, um, compared to a Fortune, you know, a S&P 500 company, I was working in the technology center, to the federal government, just the, um, the difference in quality of employees. And, they, mm -hmm. and when I got hired in 2020, the, 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 net, the newest employee that was hired before me was hired in 2004. They just don't move, and that is the swamp. Yep. And they, they, every couple of years, they um, they get their GS moved up, and they stay, and they don't move. And they cry. And each year, they, they, they take their budget, the projects, and their budget proposals go and champion for more money. <coughs> and it's just and so so supporting President Trump's initiative to cut the swamp, to go in and cut is, is the way to do it. Okay, this next one maybe bounces back a little bit to uh, the Chinese question, but certainly it's a, to uh, nations around the world. Is it too late to institute a program where foreigners, foreign nations, or groups of foreign individuals can only rent property in the United States instead of being able to buy it outright? So, I don't know of any... You know, if if they become a U.S. citizen, then that, that Chinese national now U.S. citizen, you would have to 
institute a lot of legislation if you want to restrict foreigners from owning land. And you, and I know people get emotional because they see that China is buying up land, farming land. And, and but the if you outlawed, if you you could outlaw China from owning land, but. There's a lot of unintended consequences that come to that, and and I've also read some things about that issue because it's an emotional issue for a lot of people about what is the harm. I know there's like the spy next to military bases, but in general, if a foreigner owns a farmland, it's not like they can take it and leave with it. You know, it's still this, you could if we go to war with China, we can just. It, you know, you just confiscate. It. So, mm -hmm. so that's there's. I, I've read a you know number of different things, and I know some of the local politicians want to ban China from owning foreign land. It's just it would be very hard, and you might have the unintended consequences of. You know, so say you're Saudi Arabia. You know, it's like, would you invest if your land might get taken if the next step of xenophobia goes against Islam nations? So anyway, so it's a slippery slope, and so. Um, I, I've read a lot of pros and cons, but I don't think it's a simple solution for saying that. Okay. I'm going to leave this up to the audience. I have a question in front of me that is definitely going to lead to a back and forth discussion. Would you rather I held it to the end? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> then we'll hold that to the end. All right. The next question is: Do you feel we should keep funding Ukraine every time? President Zelensky comes to us for more money. We're trying. We're trying. Uh, and yet our people are suffering and he's asking us for more money. So, so quick answer is yes. So, um, and uh, the, the new secretary, uh, of the, the speaker of the house, I think his, his views kind of mirror mine on that. I know on that, um, Congressman Webster voted against and that was, he was for <coughs> Israel against Ukraine, but um, and, and, and usually in the past he kind of voted for, so he was kind of on the line. And one of the things is, um, I actually I got to print out of all the aid we, we give them, when we say we give them, um, I guess as of earlier this year, it was total $44 billion of aid over the last many years, okay, well, even in Trump's administration. And, but if, if you actually look through the aid, it's not like we gave them $44 billion of cash. We gave them aid well, valued at $44 billion, okay? And some of it is the um, Hawk Air Defense Missile System. We gave them a whole bunch of those. But we retired that system in the early 80s. They were still in the warehouses. We're giving them... Um, the M113 armored personnel carrier, a lot of them, they were produced in the 1960s. Used well, in the before. <laughs> in the, before. Um, we're giving them a lot of ammunition that was produced in the 70s, 155 millimeter artillery shell. So a lot of these are come from our war stockpiles. So um, we're giving them physical, tangible aid that's going over there. And this is different from some of the financial checkbook aid the Europeans have given them, which is more prone to corruption. Mm -hmm. So we're giving them these actual pieces of equipment that the War Department or the Defense Department does not want anymore. So from that, as we give them, you know, a billion dollars worth of artillery shells, <coughs> then Congress allocates the U.S. defense industries to produce a billion dollars of new artillery shells to go back into the warehouse. So what was once 30-year-old ammunition is now brand new ammunition that's in our warehouse. So by giving them this equipment over to Ukraine, we're actually helping ourselves become a better defensive deterrent. Now, and then also in the Ukraine-Russia fight, um, Russia is, has never been on our side. And um, one of the, you know, you think about well, the Cold War and all that, but just in recent years, in eastern Syria, um, in 2018, while President Trump was in power, we had an outpost called the Conoco Outpost 
uh, the special forces and stuff in Eastern Ukraine. They, Russia, promoted or encouraged the, their Syrian proxy to attack the U.S. forces there. So the U.S. Army, I mean, the Defense Department is well aware, and it would have gotten to be a lot worse conflict had not had we not had a strong president that was a deterrent and stopped it. But when it happens again, and we have a president, and it happens after 4 o'clock in the evening, <laughs> and, and, you know, so, so us giving this aid to Ukraine, it's, it's, the magnitude is there, but it's not like these artillery shells can build a new schoolhouse in a, in a, in a, in a neighborhood that needs a new schoolhouse. And by giving them the aid, um, they're in a kind of grotesque terms, but they're able to, to eliminate a lot of their soldiers, a lot of the Russian soldiers. They're able to kill a lot. They're getting better effects than the U.S. got in Iraq and Afghanistan. So they are uh, achieving a lot of great things with the old cast-off equipment that we're giving them. So, and for everything that um, we did give them some new tanks, so the new M1 tanks, but every time one of those gets defeated, we analyze. Um, and when I was um, working for the Army up in D.C., we analyzed the drone warfare that was going on. So we are benefiting 100% from Ukraine's help. Okay. So, yes. Mike, it seems to me that we're just doing a back and forth here on paper without going through the questions that were originally submitted. No, I'm, I'm asking every no, question. No, I'm just saying. It just seems like we're on a track, with one-way track here with the questions. No, about. we're not. Um, okay. And what okay. I'm trying to do is I'm trying to do John, a flow, okay? John, and I know you want to get to election integrity. I know that, okay? Well, but that is... No, no, I'm good. I'm good. You're sure? Yep, I'm good. Yeah, okay. yeah we're asking that right up front. Oh, he yeah. had a party long. Okay. Well, so okay. he's good. No, <laughs> okay, the next question is about Amendment 4. What's your understanding of it? How are you going to vote? Uh, I was talking this morning, and um, yeah, I'm seeing all the vote no's. And I'm actually um, up until the other day with the social media post, I was very confused over it. So, <laughs> and um, so yeah, the wording of, of amendments and, and propositions are always very interesting how they're worded. But uh, I don't know. Do we have one of those handouts from yeah, the yeah, ladies' luncheon? Right here. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, and here's an interesting question on. That issue, okay? That's best. Along with more help for low-income women get, getting when they have an unwanted pregnancy, I never hear anyone mention free birth control right. accompanied by some education. What are your feelings on that? So, um, well, that's definitely a local issue, not a federal issue. Right. But um, actually, I've been in places where they've had free birth control and free education mm -hmm. on that. And did it work? Uh, I don't know. So, but, you know. <laughs> okay. So, but I, you, you know, I, I will tell you, you know, my background is not healthcare. I listen to my wife. But um, in Afghanistan, uh, it, you know, it, in Afghanistan, a lot of our issues that we faced as Army, an Army unit, we were in a really remote mountainous region on the uh, Pakistan border, and we were fighting our insurgents and stuff. But when we engaged with our villages, the, the local inhabitants, infant mortality and maternal mortality were the number one issues. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually, our soldiers, we carried these um, USAID and, and other Red Cross. It was a, a big, kind of a big plastic mat that you rolled out and it had surgical equipment, the string, the tie, the umbilical cord, and it had pictures of how to do a delivery, and it was it was all in pictures, and it was this one of the most uh, effective toolkits we had to handle the um, infant and maternal mortality in our issue that we were trying to. Um, and we did not know, you know, it was definitely not our a subject matter expertise, and uh, um, but it was between the, the the infant dying at birth and then shortly afterwards, or the the mother dying right afterwards, is the, 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 and, you know, all that, she's continuing to bleed out. All those issues um, were, were like our, one of our top priorities of, of 
that's in our in our second. Wow. Uh, one more thing to worry about. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So so yeah. Oh, holy cow. Okay. Next, what is your take on election integrity? Will you support grassroots efforts to afford change in Florida's election process? We can change that to national. Okay. So if you'd like. yeah. So I, 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 anything to do a. Um, better quality control on the elections, the election integrities. And so, but the, it goes back to the last question, at a national level, do you, do you really need the national government to interfere in a state to have a state running a competent election? You know, um, having a, passing a, a just a, a voter ID law um, might be the exception to that, but you don't need any federal, because what would happen if the federal government they would, they would give one, one set process to do it, and it would not change over time. Like any bureaucracy, it would just set. And if the benefit of having all 50 states handle their own election is every, every election, one state will be the weak link in any election. In 2000, Florida was the laughing stock of the nation with the yeah. hanging chap. Florida. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah right. and so everybody made fun of Florida, and so you uh -huh. think that the, the voters in Florida would get upset and fix their election, and so now uh, yeah, they do. talking to you know friends in Georgia, uh -huh. they're embarrassed that Georgia is having issues. Sure. Yeah. So um, so you constantly want to improve your process. Okay, now we're going to get into some. Oh, maybe not. All right, now we're going to get into some local stuff. Okay. All right, and and it is important because uh, a congressman, yeah. a, 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 a CD11 congressman, has a tremendous amount of influence in this area. So it's important to know how you stand on local issues. And this person would like to hear a statement from you on your perspective on the actions taken by the Jordan brothers regarding Carrie Baker's current seat. What would you prefer to be done, if anything? Well, okay, so uh, I, I, I see all the social media back and forth on it, and I'm not waving at all. And, and one of the things that you know, strikes me, if you think of the, the two parties trying to be you know, as neutral as possible looking at the case, is um, Kerry Baker, who I, I like a lot, he should not have been, you know, trying to save eleven thousand dollars by doing a, a writing candidate. It's a little bit dishonest. He's a Republican. He should register as a Republican and pay the eleven thousand. So I think he was trying to um, cheat the system a little bit there, and so so he's not totally without fault. But what's and, and so the Jordan brothers. You know, reading the rules, they might have been able to do this fast one, and um, so you could say that's legal. But the sad thing is, you know, it's, is it really ethical? No. And so, besides everybody saying it's not really ethical, trying to, to cheat the system, they also what even got me is apparently they were kind of friends. Okay. Yes. So, irregardless of the whole election. That's your, your friend backstabbing you in the back. Uh -huh. right. So the, the election aside, that is the biggest issue. Yeah. And then the, the second issue is the unethical reeling. And then the third issue is Kerry Baker just trying to be cheat the system and save 11,000. So it, it's <clears throat> everyone's at fault with that. The worst thing is just a, a friendship loss, which is if your best friend did that, and um, you know. That's why they're being called Judas. It's, it's a perfect example. And, 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 um, and you would hope that people remember that at election time. Mm -hmm. And so I know there's a lot of uproar now, and I, and I hope it shares more. Ralph wants so, to expand know, I, on since this. Since she spoke out of turn, can I do it now? Yeah. Okay. You can make a All comment. Right. All yeah. right, I want to make a comment. First of all, do you know why <laughs> Kerry did that? You don't do it. You he's think trying, he's, he's trying, trying to cheat the system? No, he's trying to save his, his, his supporters' money. I, 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 I how's that, cheat, that cheating the system? 
following the rules. If you're the, a Republican, the rules, allow, sure the rules Republican. allow for it. That's like me intentionally walking your kid and you're saying I'm cheating. But okay, it's in the rules. so Sorry. you're saying that the rules allow for it. Okay, so he followed, he, the rules allow for it. Yeah. He voted, he registered as non Republican as a writing candidate. As a, as a writing candidate, all right. he needs is one vote. Yeah. He, he gets okay. the. So he Most got, candidates that would do that? Ralph, I'm so, going to so, explain so, the format so he, here. The format is for the candidate to no, so, express so, so, his opinion. So, 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 it is not for you to challenge I'm trying, yeah. no, and so, argue. Uh, so, so, Ralph, I read all your, I read all your Facebook posts, by the way. So, <laughs> you need um, to get a life. <laughs> so, uh, it. No vote. So, no vote. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so uh, I saw he had a strategy to be the writing candidate. And so he was naive, yes. So yeah, I'll give you yeah, that. Yeah. But anyway. he wasn't cheating the system because four thousand of that money goes to RPOF yeah. and this group. So, and, and we gladly said keep it. We'd rather you do that. So, anyway, that so he, he, yeah. he tried, he, he had did. a strategy, he we tried to gladly said yeah. so, well, Ralph, we, even his yeah. wife told him he should have paid the money. I know, that's a I whole other thing. So you know, we're all saying. <laughs> if you just the same listen thing. to his wife. <laughs> yeah. And that's so, exactly but, what he said. But the sad thing is that uh, from what I read on on, on Facebook, because I don't know either party really. Yeah. Um, is that it's a sad thing because it's your best, your, yep. your friend. That, right? The only other thing I might add, you said it's like there's two sides. There really isn't. Even one of the supporters told me it's going 90 10 towards Kerry. There's really nobody making a coherent argument other than the goofy uh, Jordan brothers themselves. Uh, even most of their surrogates have turned tail on and, and left the ship. So I, I personally think his strategy is just be quiet, hope it rolls over because at no, the election time, people will. Just vote well, let's, 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 let's go, go on. It's going to be right, let's, let's move on. We're not, we can get into the discussion after the public portion of the format. All right. Next question. What is your perception of local grassroots Republican priorities, and what will you do to implement them? Local grassroots You, you, you're on Facebook. You do the social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you priorities? see as the important local grassroots So, and, and, and I will tell you, um, for District 11, you know, when Lake County, when I look at issues here, we're wrapped up between the, the, the Kerry Baker, Jordan, and we have Sabatini Webster on their lawsuits back and forth. Other parts of the district, particularly in the villages, it's on elderly issues. Uh, the Social Security um, and veterans issues. There's a lot of old veterans out there. And I'll pass this around. This is Webster's old voting veterans. record on veteran issues. Some yes, some no, and he's wishy-washy. He's not a veteran. And so that's the number one issue on the older veterans that are moving to the villages. And um, the so for that part of the district, it's uh, and it's on Social Security. So, and the local issues, as far as that, is people are moving to the villages on their fixed income, buying their house, and they're moving down here, and all of a sudden the taxes are going up, the property taxes, the insurance taxes. And then the, so if you think about, you know, your, your fixed income budget, and now your insurance rate on your house doubled. Okay? So. More than doubled. Yeah. And, and one of it is, if you think of... <coughs> With all the claims, some of the insurers pulled out, so you have less competition. Uh -huh. And but the biggest one is they have to insure on the rebuild cost of your home. So because inflation, your building materials, your labor to rebuild your house after that catastrophe is going to increase. And actually, your your premiums are going to have to go up because they have to have the break even. And so. Tackling the inflation will bring down the cost of materials, and which will help the rebuild cost, and that will help the premium. And the other one is making sure you're attracting enough insurance companies into the Florida market. So they might be 5% exposed to you know, hurricanes in Florida, but then they have you know, insured properties in the Great Lakes and West Coast, New England, that, you know, covers costs of any one year catastrophes. So that would, that would be called. So those are the issues that Florida District 11 are talking about outside of Lake County and our, and our issues here with personalities. Yeah. 
Yeah. So. And, don't, and don't leave out litigation and fraud when it comes to insurance. Yeah. All right. Point, point of information. Do you walk neighborhood? Do you walk neighborhoods? Yeah, I walk neighborhoods here for fun and go out to the villages in East Orange County. Yes. And I try to get out as much as possible. Okay. You've got a unique uh, perspective on this, John. What will you do to reduce Islam and Muslim infiltration and disruption of American culture? Ouch, that's... Ooh. Wow, that's Ooh. okay. That's deep. Thank you. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. so it, you know, it, it, if you think of, um, we look at our, our, our immigration visas, you, know, you can have your anchor baby that kind of comes in, or a one single relative, and then then they can sponsor other relatives. And then one of the issues is kind of like um, the Democrats talk DEI when it's in their favor, but some of the most undiversity, undiversified districts are the Minnesota, Wisconsin, Somali districts. Michigan, and so if you think of that, that is a, it, it, it plants and it grows. Yeah. And so uh, they're not mixing and becoming assimilated into the American culture. And it's right. a lot of them. So it would be more stringent on the visas. Okay. All right, uh, and before I ask, I have one question left. Before I ask that question, I would like to announce that next Friday, I will have the honor of moderating with Mr. Keith Farner. Hey, okay. Friday, edition 26. Looking forward to it. Okay, so I just wanted to announce that. And uh, with this question, uh, we will end the public session. I'm sure uh, Mr. McCloy is more than willing to hang out and answer personal questions. And uh, uh, but this will end the public portion of this program. And this is from Ralph. He identified okay. himself on the question. Wait a minute, you didn't get my question. Can I ask my question before you ask his question? Does sure. Does cause an argument? <laughs> yes. My question is pretty simple. When President Trump was elected, we had all three branches of government, and the House of Representatives, Paul Ryan in particular, turned his back on the president and secured our board. I want to know if that situation happens again, you're going to stand up for our president and secure our border, and I don't give a damn what everybody else votes. I want to know what you're going to vote. Right. I'm going to vote. For a secure border, option. Thank you. And, and Thank you. I, I thought, yeah, I have a lot of issues with when he was speaking. He just was, uh, he was not a leader. I'm sorry. Keith, the reason I did question. not ask that question is because I thought he answered that yeah. adequately at the beginning. No, to be honest, securing the border, building the wall is the most straightforward thing. Everybody's you going to ask Mike Kirkin question? All, our administration now says the border is secure. And we know that's a lie. It's a lie. So. And, and the sad, the sad thing is, uh, working in, a, in a, the government contracts, is the um, when Trump contracted, they built, they contracted it out, they bought the material, and the Biden administration purposely stopped it. Yes. They stopped the contract. The materials were, were sold off at pennies on the dollar. Oh, so he went out of his way. The Biden administration went out of his way to not even, not even doing that, but basically the opposite way of canceling contracts that were building the wall. And I agree with all of that, so. but for the first two years, they had all three branches of government, and it could have been done, and President Trump had to go through tremendous litigation to take away from the defense budget right, yeah. to get yeah. things done. Right. We could have had a support border in right. four years of this so, administration with the right help. Yeah, no, it, it, with the right, with the right, uh, leaders in Congress. Okay, thank you. And, and, but and thank my, you for your service. But, but my point was that he eventually got it done. He eventually got the con but it was like, and but they got a contract, and then it was purposely stopped. By the way. I understand. You might, Vera did not hear the question. Could you repeat it for her, please? The one about the secure border? Yeah. Oh, that was you. That Sorry. was me. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't read it, but I'll say it. When President Trump was elected, they had all three branches of government. The House, the White House, and the Senate. Yep. And when they came up to securing our border, the House of Representatives, who was the uh, the chairman or was Paul Ryan, they turned their back yes. on our president. Okay, yep. I got it. All right. Okay. And he had to go through massive litigation, which slowed yeah. the process down. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm expanding now. I'm yeah, sorry. None of us could hear. But I want to know that, that when we get a representative from our district up there, they're going to stand with President Trump, and I don't care what kind of pressure they get from the party. Yes. I want them standing with President yes. Trump and securing yes. our border. Yes. Yes. Okay, here we go.